In the late 1950s, scientists all over the world were striving to be the first to launch a satellite into Earth orbit. Now the Soviets, they were the first when they launched Sputnik, which was a spherical metal ball weighed just under 200 pounds and was launched into low Earth orbit in 1957. And this scared a lot of people. A lot of Americans were concerned. First of all, they were shocked that they didn't win. Americans weren't used to getting beat. They were the best at everything. And the Soviets had just beat them. So that was a shock. But Americans also feared what the Soviets might be able to do. This, this indicated that perhaps the Soviets were ahead when it came to space tech. And if they could launch Sputnik, well, what else are they going to do? Are they going to weaponize a, a future Sputnik? Are they going to apply this new technology and know-how to the delivery systems for nuclear missiles? Or, you know, this was a, a real fear. And it spurred the Americans to ramp up their space efforts. And, of course, Sputnik is going to kick off a space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. But the space race was about a lot more than who had the best space tech. Really, it was a geopolitical phenomenon. And both sides felt that by demonstrating their superiority in space, they were also demonstrating the superiority of their system. In this case, we're talking about American capitalism versus Soviet communism. And both sides knew that the rest of the world was watching and judging based on you know space advancements so sort of a very, an interesting phenomenon a microcosm of the cold war that was really a nationalist test to see which side was superior at the end of the day though sputnik was much more than even the launch of the space race between the two great superpowers of the cold war sputnik was the initiation of a new age a space age the Soviets were the first to launch a satellite successfully into Earth orbit. And then, just a month later with Sputnik 2, they were the first to launch an animal into space successfully. The dog's name was Laika, a Moscow stray that had been picked up and stuck into the significantly larger Sputnik 2, as compared to Sputnik 1, and launched into space. Laika did make it into space as the first animal in space, but did not make it back alive. Ended up getting, I think, burned up. But in any case, another first in space. And then, in April 1961, the Soviets were the first to put a human being in space. And the, this human being actually did make it back alive and well. Yuri Gagarin. And this placement of a man in space, this was very troublesome to many Americans. Although it was, of course, celebrated by Soviet partisans who saw it as evidence that the Soviet system was superior. To the American one. Well, John F. Kennedy saw it as a challenge, but he was also disturbed by the fact that the Soviets were so obviously ahead when it came to space tech and know-how. And so this is when he issues his famous goal to the American people. Basically, he says, we're going to get a man on the moon and back successfully before the end of the decade. I therefore ask the Congress above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. So that was the challenge. That was the new challenge of recently organized NASA. Well, there is another side to the Yuri Gagarin story. See, most of the Soviet Union's space firsts are due in large part to one man. His name was Sergei Korolev. And the interesting thing about him is he never got credit in his own lifetime because he was a prisoner. He was a Soviet prisoner. He was one of the many victims, hundreds of thousands of victims, of the Stalinist purges of the late 1930s. But he was still useful. So as a prisoner, he was put to work. And it's his genius that's largely responsible for the first intercontinental ballistic missile, for Sputnik, Sputnik 2, and Laika, for Yuri Gagarin, and so many other Soviet space firsts, human space firsts. 
but it's, he dies later on in the 60s, and at that point, the Americans are, are, are moving ahead in terms of the space race. So Yuri Gagarin, as far as he's concerned, unfortunately, he's going to die within just a few years of his space flight on a routine you know, test flight, jet aircraft test flight. And his remains and Sergei Korolev's remains will be buried together. And finally, Sergei Korolev, by the end of the decade, is starting to get credit for all that he had done. On July 20th, 1969, NASA finally accomplished the goal that had been set years earlier by now slain President JFK. And that goal, of course, being to get a man on the moon and then back home safely by the end of the decade. Well, now we're in 1969, so they barely made it. But it had been a long road, costly road, very costly in terms of money and costly in terms of blood to get there. First, there had been the Mercury program from 61 to 63. And the Mercury program saw the first American in space, Shepard, saw John Glenn orbit the Earth multiple times. Then there'd been the Gemini program, which had seen the first spacewalk and done lots of tweaking and perfecting in preparation for the Apollo missions. That's the next program to come along, Apollo. Apollo 1 was a major tragedy. Three astronauts lost their lives, burned up. Then the first manned Apollo mission was Apollo 7. Then Apollo 8, the first time human beings had ever orbited the moon. So very, very big mission. Apollo 9 and 10 test the lunar modules. And then Apollo 11, finally, you see that successful moon landing. This is the Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins mission. Apollo 12, also a successful moon landing. Apollo 13, that famous malfunction. But then Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17, all successful moon landings. 12 different astronauts land and walk on the moon between 1969 and 1972, which is the year of the last mission. The space race was more than just a vehicle by which millions of people might feel national pride or national humiliation, depending on what was going on, and who was carrying it out or not carrying it out. It was also the dawn of a new age of scientific research, a new age of exploration. Now you could actually talk about exploring the moon or exploring other moons or other planets in our solar system or even beyond our solar system for real. I mean, that was a, a reality now. So that's all true. But in the process of doing so, in, in the process of making that happen, a new age of government intervention in science, in research, was also launched. Today, many people can't imagine any sort of real scientific research being done without massive government plans and infusions of government money through subsidies and grants and other things. As if we'd you know, be plunged into a dark age with all, without all of this you know, centralized funding. That can be problematic, that sort of attitude, simply because if the government is funding science, largely funding science, and the same goes with arts and other things, if the government is funding these things, then the government is at least playing a role in directing these things, in controlling the direction of these things. Lastly, the space race continued to fuel the competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. But happily, by the mid-1970s, uh, that space competition had been at least partly replaced by space cooperation. Uh, by the mid-70s, the U.S. And, and the Soviets, they're running joint missions. And today, of course, you have the International Space Station, where you see cooperation taking place between Americans and Russians, as well as Japanese, Canadians, and a European contingent. If you're interested in taking a deeper dive into history, consider one of my full courses, each including something like 400 plus pages of text, 30 plus hours of audio, 50, 60, 70 on location videos filmed all over the world, plus all the scaffolding you could ask for should you want to take it like a traditional student. We're talking guided notes, both blank and filled, quizzes, structure training, document lessons. These really are unique and one of a kind. Check them out. Also, if you want to support what I do here, consider joining Nomad Nation, where you'll gain exclusive access to monthly webinars, Q&A, a monthly newsletter called Nomad Notes, special live stream events from all over the world. I'll send you four postcards a year, discounts. Go check all this out at nomadicprofessor.com.